Hey everybody, welcome to the next video and today what I want to talk about is Iceberg and the Data Lakehouse because one of the key things that Apache Iceberg makes possible is the idea of a Data Lakehouse. So to really understand why that's so important, let's talk about what is a Data Lakehouse and like why does this matter? So let's talk about the status quo. So like what is it like that a lot of data companies and or data centric companies are dealing with nowadays? Okay, so nowadays what's happening is that you may have maybe a company that you have your data source. So this would be like your OLTP systems, your operational databases that are running your applications and the application side of things, and they have data. Okay, so then what you're going to do is you're going to ETL that data to the data lake. Okay, so think of the data lake as just sort of this big repository where you're going to just store all your data. Okay, because it just basically you're dumping grounds for data. Okay, which could be object storage, an HDFS cluster, and again, HDFS stands for Hadoop file storage. All that it could just be dumped there. And the reason being is that generally your data lake storage is cheap. Object storage is cheap. Okay, uh, a Hadoop cluster is relatively cheap. Okay, versus buying a bunch of high-powered data warehouse machines. So generally you're going to have all your data stored in the data lake. And then what you'll do is you'll ETL a subset of that data that you want to analyze into your data warehouse. Problem number one is you can only really use your, your structured data. Okay, and the problem is once you ETL and make a copy of that data, so when you ETL that data from the data lake, each time you do this, you're making a copy. I'm taking the data source and making a copy of the data that now exists in the data lake, and then making another copy that's inside the data warehouse, which stores it in a proprietary format, so we have no idea how it's storing the data under the hood. Could be Parquet, could be RC, could be their own thing. Um, you don't really understand like how any of the stuff works as a black box and that can be really appealing because hey look I can just use a black box It's really easy I don't know what's going on inside of it but I can use it okay I get this sort of nice sort of box exper uh, experience like you don't know how your car works but you can use it and there's something nice about that but the problem is that this is your your lifeblood of your company your data okay now it's kind of like locked in here okay and now what's gonna happen several different problems okay one the data warehouse is really expensive because they know they got your data locked in okay um, you know it's just like kind of like anything else where like if you buy the thing kind of already built for you top to bottom it's generally going to be more expensive and if you buy if you buy all the individual pieces separately and put them together you're going to save yourself a lot of money um, that's essentially what's kind of going on here except now you have that further angle of sort of that locked in you don't know what's going on underneath the hood um, you're using proprietary components, so you are locked in. Okay, basically it's going to be really hard to get your data out, so you're locked into having to use that vendor going forward, unless you really want to have to pay huge migration costs and deal with huge migration issues, um, which are fine, but then there's always that fear that you might have to do it again. And then there's the idea of tool lockout, because you're going to see all these shiny tools that become available with all these really cool features and performance and now you can't use them because your data is locked over here in the data warehouse okay instead of it being accessible on your data lake so there's that issue okay then there's data drift okay so what happens is you've made so many copies of the data the data from the and not only have I copied a made a second copy in my data warehouse so I have the original copy the data lake copy and the data warehouse copy so my this is my third set of the data but in my data warehouse, I might have broken that up into different marts, so different like sub data warehouses. Okay, and then those sub data warehouses may, may have been broken, made additional copies of that data. And then the data analyst might have made extracts of some of those data. So they downloaded like a copy of that data as a CSV file or like a subset of that data so that way they can run BI a bit quicker than if they did it on the full data set. But now you have this, cop this unaccountable copy that's on someone's computer that you can't track or are aware of. Uh, that creates all sorts of compliance issues. So you have this whole drift of data. So data is just kind of like all, now copies of your data all over the place. Have people using the, the consistent copy? Are they using the wrong copy of the data? Um, becomes kind of hard to kind of keep track of it all. Okay, so it just gets a little, becomes a bit of a mess. So we have all these problems in the status quo, and we kind of would like to avoid them. Okay, and that's where we get to the idea of a data lake house. So same idea, you take your data, you tell it to your data lake, you know, which could be object storage, HDFS, whatever. But the idea is that instead of ETLing it into a data warehouse, you're going to organize the data at this point into Apache Iceberg tables. Okay. And the beauty is now all your data on your data lake is now you're able to run 
uh, data warehouse like workloads, a data warehouse like speed and convenience, but on your data lake. Okay, and you have all sorts of tools like Dremio, okay, that really make that experience very pleasant and gives you that sort of like, you know, I'm, I'm in the box feel without the box. Okay, you don't have to be locked in and you can get that sort of really easy, nice graphical user interface, uh, intuitive UI kind of experience that you would get with a data warehouse, but on your data lake. You're not paying for double storage and having this having to pay a whole lot more to store a subset of your data in the data warehouse. Um, you can use other tools. You can use Spark. You can use Flink. You can use all the tools, um, and you don't have to wait for anyone's permission, okay, because it's an open format. You're not, you're, you're not the beck and call of some particular party. Um, so data lakes are inexpensive, so you save a lot of money. Okay, so the idea is that the more you operationalize, you make your data lake the center of your data world, okay, where you do your analytics, the more money you'll save. Okay, so we're going to give it these data warehouse like features and that's why we call it the data lake house. It's a data lake with data warehouse features or a data lake that feels like a data warehouse. And then Apache Iceberg again enables a data warehouse like performance because again you have that metadata that's going to allow engines to be more, a little more performantly um, beyond their own optimization, even further performantly be able to query that data. Okay, and basically by using those open formats, you don't have to lock in and lock out. So you can now go use whatever tool you want. And when new tools come out, those tools can build compatibility with your data. They don't have to like worry about whether this vendor is going to create like an open API that they can access. Like that's an open standard. Anyone can use it. So future tools will give you the ability to use a format. Current tools can use that format. Um, it just works and, and basically again that's going to allow the environment where again it's keep cost in check and always give you best in breed tools. So that is sort of like the benefit and the reason for the data lake house. And again Apache Iceberg is really that nice layer that all your tools can then interact with your data. So you have all your data, all these individual files stored and we can interact with interact with it from there. So to create the data lake house the way to think about a data lake house is really five components okay so essentially what we did is that instead of having this one big box a data warehouse that just kind of does all these things for you but again comes with the cost the lock-in um then you have the issues with the data drift and all that stuff instead of one source of truth what we can do is we can take those five components put them together ourselves which is a lot easier nowadays um and you have this data lake house and you get the, all the benefits, all the performance, all the features um, at a fraction of the cost, along with no lock-in or lock-out. So the first layer is just like how you, where you're going to store the data, which you could use like object, cloud object storage, you could use Hadoop file system clusters. Um, nowadays everything's kind of moving in that direction of like cloud object storage. Um, but then you're going to store your data in a format. So generally you're going to want some sort of open file format. Um, that's that's sort of optimized for analytics, so that's typically going to be sort of like Apache Parquet files, okay? Because there's an open format, it's a columnar format, which is better for analytics. So basically, you're going to store all your data in object storage using Parquet files, but we need to organize those Parquet files so we can recognize, hey, like these thousand files are one table, these ten thousand files over here are another table. So we need an, a, a table format like an Apache Iceberg. And as we'll learn as we get into the architecture of Apache Iceberg, we need some sort of mechanism for tracking which tables exist. So yes, one set of Apache Iceberg metadata tells us about an individual table that exists, but there might be dozens of tables or hundreds of tables on our data lake and we need something that kind of tracks where can I find the metadata for this table, this table, that table, and that's going to be the catalog. And that catalog could be some, using something like Project Nessie, which we'll talk about, uh, AWS Glue, Hive, some sort of mechanism to be able to track okay, what tables exist and then point us to the, the metadata from the table format, which then will point us to the files, which are located on the object storage. And once we have sort of that set up in place, then basically any engine that's going to try to uh, run operations, run analytical queries and things like that on our data, okay, can do that easily. Okay, so these are tools like Dremio, Spark, Presto, Trino, um, you know, you can, you name your favorite tool, okay. And essentially what's going to happen is that they're going to, whatever engine you're using, they're going to connect to whatever catalog you chose. Say, hey, where's the table that I'd like to run an operation on? We're just going to point them to the metadata in the table format. 
and that's going to allow them to determine which files they need to scan and then they'll be able to find those files that are scanned in your whatever you, medium you stored it in okay and then that's essentially what a data how a data lake lake house works so basically these are the choices you have to make so when designing and architecting a data lake house you've got to choose like where you're going to store your data what what file format i want to store the data in um what table format i'm going to use uh what catalog will i use to track those tables and what engines am i going to use to actually like run work on that data okay but that's essentially like the data lake house world and like a little primer on architecting a data lake house and the kind of decisions you make when when building a data lake house okay so just to kind of show you an example again this is just an example architecture uh, for a data lake house okay so in here in this case we chose like s3 amazon s3 as our storage layer and our file format is apache parquet and then again, we choose Apache Iceberg as our table format because it's going to give us features like asset transactions, time travel, partition evolution, um, schema evolution, hidden partitioning. And again, it supports all sorts of different file formats like Parquet, ORC, and Avro. And then as far as our catalog, we can choose again Nessie, Hive, AWS Glue. Um, and again, there's going to be other choices we'll discuss. And then we can use an engine like Dremio, which provides us that easy intuitive UI. So that way you get that easy uh, data warehouse like UI experience. Okay. Gives you a semantic layer so you can kind of control the access and that can become the access layer uh, for all your data consumers. Um, and you can control the permissions and that way, instead of having to like tweak permissions here and tweak permissions there, if you have data in multiple sources, Apache iceberg tables, uh, a Postgres database, other, uh, just other data you might have on S3, you can kind of control access to all of that through one sort of interface. It's high performance. So not only do you get the performance benefits from Apache Iceberg, but you're going to get the benefits from uh, Dremio's uh, built-in optimization, such as uh, Apache, using Apache Arrow to optimize a lot of different points in its processing. Uh, it's columnar cloud cache and reflections, um, essentially, which is a really cool, unique sort of materialization type technology. It connects directly to BI tools, so you can connect, connect directly to like Tableau, um, Power BI, Hex, and other um, you know uh, BI tools. And again, with Dremio Cloud, you have this nice cloud managed service. Now, the cool thing is, is that you know you might be Dremio might be great for many use cases of yours, but it doesn't preclude you from using other engines. And the reason being is because you chose to work in open formats. You chose to use Apache Parquet and Apache Iceberg. And because of this, you can use a variety of different lake house engines to work with your data. Okay. Um, you know, depending on what your use cases and needs are. And that's the beauty of open data lake house architecture. Um, because basically you have a table format that has an even playing field because while Dremio is one contributor to the Apache Iceberg project, there are many other companies, um, which include other engines that contribute and, 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 and really embrace this format. And um, basically, every, everyone ends up just building better tooling for you out of for it. So that's pretty cool. So with that, I'll see you in the next video. Where we're going to talk about an overview of the architecture of Apache Iceberg. I'll see you there.